How's it going, folks? We should be live. Uh, I'll get confirmation of that in a moment. In the meantime, if you guys can hear me, uh, I've got multiple <laughs> intro music playing. Um, if you guys can see me and hear me, let me know. Uh, if there's any issues with the video or sound, let me know that as well. But I think we should be good. Uh, I'm not seeing anybody in the chat just yet, but... <clears throat> Once somebody types something in the chat, I'll know that we're uh, up and running. So, all right, welcome to the live stream uh, for this week or this month. We haven't done one since, um, I believe, in early January. So, uh, oh, we have a hi. Great. Can hear you. Cool. All right, so we should be up and running. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, oh, Brian, good seeing you, man. Um yeah, so today's uh, stream is with a special guest, Dr. Oh, and I should have confirmed that I was saying this right, but uh, she can let me know when she gets on it. Uh, Jennifer Busio, I think is how it's pronounced. Um, she, she can let me know when she gets on, but... <clears throat> um, so she's going to be teaching our middle period history course. So it's a course that covers roughly 200 CE through about the mid 1300s um, and it's basically a continuation of the early China course that I taught last year uh, which was super popular and we got a lot of requests uh, to do sort of a sequel to that course um, so she'll be teaching that for us um, let's see Mark good seeing you can see and hear me good Rebecca Vic, excellent, up and running. Uh, David, it looks like maybe you might be having some audio problems on your end. Maybe uh, if you refresh, well, you probably can't hear me saying this, but if you uh, reload your page, hopefully that'll fix it. Um, but it seems like everybody else is hearing me, so it's likely something on your end. Maybe your speakers aren't uh, working or something. Um Elias, good seeing you too. Um, so yeah, so what we're going to do today is basically, if you've seen previous live streams that we've done with other teachers uh, for our other courses, it's going to be a similar format. So I'm going to bring her on in just a moment. We're going to talk a little bit about her experience learning Chinese, how she got into it, and what brought her to the study of, um, uh, you know, middle or imperial period Chinese history and specifically her her research focus, which I'll let her talk about. And then she's going to give a uh, brief presentation, which is sort of a, a demo uh, of what the course is going to be like. And we're going to she's going to be talking specifically about women in the Tang Dynasty. So it's going to be a really interesting talk. Uh, I've she actually gave this as a demo, uh, gave this talk as a demo for me and Ash, too. And we both really enjoyed it. Um, so. Yeah, uh, without further ado, I'll bring her onto the stream and she can correct my pronunciation too. So, um, welcome. Did I get it right? Or <laughs> No, no, but that's oh, okay. No. no one ever does. All right. What is it? It's Bushio. Bushio. Like the shrub, oh. Bush. Yeah. Bushio. Okay, okay, okay. I've, you know, I've been saying it Bushio in my head this entire time, and every time I talk, I keep thinking I got to confirm this with her and it just, it, it always slips my mind. So, uh, Bushio. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll correct my, uh, head pronunciation for that. <laughs> so glad to have you. Um, so yeah, if you could just start off by, um, giving us just a little, little, uh, overview of your background and how you got into learning Chinese and Chinese history specifically. Yeah, sure. I'd love to. Um, I've actually been an aficionado, can I say that, of Chinese culture for uh, a long time. And my interest was first sparked, um, gosh, uh, I won't tell you how many years it was, <laughs> um, but I was back in sixth grade when um, the tombs of the emperors of China exhibit came to our local museum. And uh, I went with my school 
with my class. I went with my family because my mom has a degree in archaeology. And so she was like, hooray, archaeology, let's go learn about it. Uh, so I went to that exhibit and I was just like blown away. I was, these people are amazing. Like, I love everything they do. I, I want to be them. <laughs> so and that was kind of in the back of my mind. Um, I grew up, I went to college and I started off in the history major very first thing as a freshman, which was a little unusual. And uh, I said, I want to study medieval China, like Tang Dynasty. That seems to be like the cool spot. Like I knew about Empress Wu. And so like that seemed like a good place to begin. And um, the, the professor I was taking the course from was a modern Middle East specialist. And so he's like, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> but I have a neighbor and he does China. So let's go talk to him. And he actually wound up being the professor who wrote the uh, chapter in our textbook on the Three Kingdoms period. Oh, cool. So I met, yeah, I met him. I met Mike Farmer. And he's like, oh, yeah, I can totally do that. Like, and he started, like, showing me all these sources. And I was reading, like, the dynastic history excerpts that have been translated in English because I hadn't studied any. And it was great. I was like, this is awesome. Like, I love everything about this. <laughs> So um, that's actually how I learned Chinese was because I wanted to do the history. So it was a little bit backwards for most people, I think. I think most people start with the language and then kind of branch off from there. But I learned Chinese because I had to, to do the history. Oh, that's interesting. So, um, so I went, yeah, I got my degree uh, in history with a minor in Asian studies. Then I went and I taught English in Taiwan for a year just to mix up my life a little yep. bit, you know, uh, love it. And then I went back, um, did grad school down at Arizona state, which at the time had the best medieval, uh, China program in the country. It was, I mean, absurd. Mm -hmm. They had gone on a bit of a hiring spree. Someone I think had written a blank check. And so like every member of the department with like three exceptions was a full professor. I mean, it was ridiculous. Oh, wow. So um, it was just a really great experience, loved it. Like, it's just one of those things that the more I got into it, the more I loved it and the more I wanted to do it more. And it was just like, give me more, give me more. So um, that's what I, I did. And I actually wound up uh, specializing in the history of religions during the medieval period. So about the fourth through the 14th century. And uh, in particular, I really like looking at those periods of it's like state collapse, you know, what happens to Chinese religions when the barbarians, so to speak, are literally at eights, you know, the state has collapsed. What do they do? Do they start talking about the end of the world and printing, uh, you know, apocalyptic scriptures? Do uh, we see Messiah figures start to come out and lead movements? Do we see them reform existing um, schools, you know, within the religious tradition? Do they found new schools? So what happens in terms of that? That was just a question that I've really enjoyed studying. And so my research tends to focus around that right now. Mm. That's really interesting. And the, <clears throat> the, the middle period, which I'm not very well versed in, <clears throat> we actually have a joke here uh, between me and Ash that once you get to the Han dynasty, they might, be, might as well be carrying around cell phones compared to the stuff that, <laughs> that we normally do. But um, <clears throat> what's interesting, and, and we started to see this uh, in the early China history course that I taught last year, um, is especially during the Han Dynasty, you start to get a lot more interaction with people in Central Asia and things like that. And to, to me, that's what really characterizes the middle period in China is cultural interaction with just uh, an ever growing number of different cultures. Uh, and then of course, also the, uh, you know, the foreign cultures that, that end up taking over China for periods of time and, and, and all that. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating period. I can't wait to bone up on my, on my middle period knowledge because beyond a few uh, calligraphers and, uh, and writers, uh, I'm not, yeah, I'm not very well versed. So it's pretty exciting. You know, I had a, a, a kind of a similar start to my Chinese. 
in that it wasn't a museum. It was way cheesier. Uh, I was at Disney World in Florida <laughs> and at Epcot. I don't know if you know Epcot, the park at Disney World, and they have a bunch of different uh, like countries, so to speak. And one of the one of the pavilions was a was China. <clears throat> and they had all this stuff and I was just like, oh, this is so cool. And I wanted to start learning Chinese, but I couldn't afford like a, they even had like uh, CD courses with books and stuff that you can learn Chinese for sale there at Disney World. <clears throat> but I, I didn't have enough allowance to get it. So I, I, it, I postponed it, but I was still interested in languages and stuff for a long time. And it wasn't until college that I actually uh, started learning it seriously, but. Yeah, it did, it did stem from a, a younger age. I think I was seven or eight years old. So, so um, let's see. What? So, okay, you, you started learning co uh, Chinese in college, and you lived in Taiwan for a year. Did you, when you were in Taiwan, did you, uh, I know you were teaching, and it's kind of hard to find time to do much else, but did you study also, or did you just kind of, use your Chinese to talk to people while you were there or, or how did you I find tried. tried? I tried. Um, yeah, I was actually trying to teach myself classical Chinese. Uh, um, yeah. While I was in Taiwan, um, it didn't really work, but it was a good experience. I liked it a lot. Yeah. Uh, I went to the mainland probably about 10 years ago now and spent a summer in Suzhou. Uh, focusing on language study, okay. and that was wonderful. Um, Suzhou is a beautiful city. I don't know if you've had a chance to visit, but uh, just gorgeous, gorgeous city. Famous. And um, uh. yeah, I have to be staying like in the historical center, very, very close to that. So you know the the canals with the picturesque bridges, and it was just gorgeous. You know, I'd walk and find them. Um, monastery that just happened to have like song dynasty you know steelies erected in the garden and it was wonderful um you know because i would have played where a building is old if it was built in like 1920 so <laughs> <laughs> it was really really nice yeah yeah it is kind of amazing uh, you know <clears throat> as an american <laughs> growing up in a young country um for me, even when I moved to Boston, I thought, wow, everything's so old, but it's a whole different thing uh, <laughs> when you're in China. Um, cool. Yeah. Suzhou. Uh, actually, Ash right now, um, you haven't met Ash, but our the co-founder of Outlier is in uh, or he's on the plane on the way to Hangzhou. Um, mm. Not too far from there, right? Uh, it's um, Dr. Baxter, Bill Baxter's. Um, 75th birthday and they're doing a conference in his honor uh so mm -hmm. actually uh, he's presenting a paper on uh, sunday so um i might have to tell him he needs to stop over to sujo and take in the scenery <laughs> it's not really his taking thing the scenery, <laughs> taking an off room you know in the gardens the way they were actually performed back in the ming dynasty do it all oh do they do like reconstructed uh sort of or like preserving the the way that they did it back then yeah, they do. Um, they do like uh, periodic performances of like, you know, uh, the Peony Pavilion and things like that. Oh, that would be awesome. <clears throat> I'm not sure he'd have any appreciation for that, but I'd enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm the one with the arts background. I was actually a music major. He was an electrical engineer before he got into Chinese. So. <laughs> was he really? Yeah, yeah. Uh, he actually, actually uh, Ash worked at NASA for a while. Um, he even designed the, like on the, when astronauts go on their spacewalks and they have the little chair that they sit in to fly around in or whatever, <laughs> there's like an antenna pack on the back that Ash didn't design, but he was like a key part in getting it approved, uh, for space flight. So, um, yeah, it totally the engineer, but hated it and was learning Chinese on the side as a hobby. Uh, and then finally said, okay, I'm, I'm done with engineering. I'm going to go learn Chinese and moved to Taiwan, got his PhD eventually. And yeah, so, <clears throat> um, cool. So I guess let's talk about the course a little bit and then we can, uh, segue from that into your, uh, presentation. Um, so yeah, can you just talk about sort of 
I gave a little brief intro, but if you could talk about, um, you know, what the course is going to cover and uh, the types of things we're going to be talking about. Yeah, so the course is arranged chronologically. We're going to cover everything from the Three Kingdoms period up to the end of the UN, the Mongol period. And within that, we're going to try and pay special attention to what's going on with women, with our non-Han uh, minorities, because as you pointed out, there's a lot of intermixing and cultural interaction during this period, particularly the first half of the period that's really important to discuss. And then we're also going to touch on religion because this is what Taoism and Buddhism really come into their own. So we're going to spend uh, a day on Taoism and a day on Buddhism within that historical context, um, looking at how they're sort of product of their times, how they developed, how they responded to different cultural concerns, um, particularly Buddhism, because it wasn't a native religion, didn't have, um, at least innately, some really important cultural connections, and it had to adapt hmm. pretty significantly to thrive in China. So we'll talk some about that. So um, that's roughly the outline of the class. What I'm hoping to do, with the exception of the first period, is to have a couple of primary sources that we'll talk about each time. So we'll have a little bit of a PowerPoint lecture, then we'll have a little break and we'll discuss those primary sources. And then we'll go back and we'll have a little, little PowerPoint and then we'll wrap up and we'll do, um, I always call them questions to ponder. I introduce them at the beginning of each lecture, just something that I want you to kind of keep in mind as lectures going on that we come back to at the end and be like, okay, like, you know, one of those bigger picture questions, like how does this fit into sort of what we've been talking about in terms of maybe Han or non-Han interaction, hmm. or why is it so hard to put China back together? You know, why can't, you know, Cao uh, Cao or any of the other people put the old Han empire back together? Why does it take hundreds of years? Hmm. You know, things like that. That's really interesting. Um, <clears throat> it, well, it calls to mind the, the famous, um, <clears throat> Excuse me, the opening line of the Senguo Yin Yi. Excuse me, sorry. It's allergy season here in Tokyo, and I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to mitigate it as much as possible. But um, from the opening of Senguo Yin Yi, where it says, uh, what is it? Hua Shuo, Zhongguo Da Shi, Fen Jiu Bi He, He Jiu Bi Fen, right? Or yeah. I've gotten it backwards. It might be the other way around. But yeah, um, that's like a, a really common. Uh, I guess, sentiment about China, especially through this period. Um, the, there's so much fracture and disunity and then periods of unity. Um, yeah, that's interesting. And also something, it seems like um, not just in China, but throughout kind of Eurasia at this time, religion is the thing that really gets spread like crazy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was looking at something the other day uh, oh, it was a wind god. And it was, um, they've traced this, I forget the name of a, the Greek wind god, but there was a Greek god that was like the god of wind, and he carried like a bag of wind over his shoulder. And then they've traced that through, um, was it Bactria? And then to China, and his name was like Fengbo or something like that. <laughs> Um, and then that got borrowed into Japan and I've seen this guy here in Japan depicted with a bag of wind over his shoulder. It was just really interesting that that, that God, or at least the iconography around the God got borrowed across all the way from Greece to Japan, you know, and they've actually been able to go and, and, and trace that. Um, it's interesting to me that that is what spreads more so than, uh, you know, philosophical ideas or, uh language borrowing I, I, obviously there's a lot of language intermixing but um that the religion is what you can really see spread like wildfire the religion you can really see but also um like material culture items you can see quite a bit as well um we'll talk about that quite a bit yeah. when we talk about the northern and southern dynasties mm -hmm. so just because there's some really cool stuff that you know central asia is bringing in and the chinese are like wow like we got to get in on this chair action you know Oh, chairs. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's right. 
Oh, that's interesting. And then you, you mentioned Taoism coming into its own. And that's something that's really interesting. And I think a lot of our students will find interesting too, because in our classical Chinese course, we've read quite a few uh, Taoist texts. And then the, the professor that, or he's not a professor right now, he's a postdoc that taught our um, intro to, to early Chinese philosophy. He's also like a practicing Taoist. Uh, but he's focused on like warring states era Taoism. And it's so different. Like, I mean, I've read a bunch, you know, I've read quite a lot of, of Zhuangzi and Laozi and things like this. But then when you get to the Taoism of the middle period, it's almost unrecognized. Yeah, it's totally. So, I mean, it's like, so you've got these foundational texts and then you've just got this kind of explosion of new ideas that come later on that like, and when I talk to, to, people about Taoism now it's like I don't get it at all <laughs> like I understand the ancient form of it you know but I don't m know much about you know what it became after that so I'll find that interesting and I think a lot of our students will too because they've really enjoyed some of the Taoist texts we've read <clears throat> yeah there's sort of two big um, transformational periods when we talk about religious Taoism one is that early sort of uh, period of disunion and then the other big one comes during the Song Dynasty. And so we'll talk about both, you know, um, transformations and how, you know, these points in time looks and functions very differently than Taoism before. Yeah. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, okay, well, I guess this is probably a good time for, for um, us to transition into your presentation. So... Uh, if you're ready for that, I'll go ahead and put your slides up on screen and I'll sit back and let you do your thing. Great. Okay, so I'd like to welcome you all to a brief presentation on the lives of imperial princesses in China from about 600 to 1750. And I've titled it Extra Ordinary with the slash in the middle because I want to acknowledge the very high stress of the one we were talking about. They are imperial princesses. But at the same time, the lives they led were not extraordinary for the time and place, despite how they might be presented to later audiences. And so today we'll be talking about four women. We'll be talking about the Empress Wu, the Princess Pingyang, the Princess Anla, and the Princess Taiping. And this is a painting. Uh, it's a mural from the uh, tomb of Princess Yang Tai, who is Princess Anla's sister, she died in uh, 701. This mural is a pigment at court. You'll notice a lovely, oops, hold on. I got so excited, I forgot to change my slide. There we go. There's the mural I was talking about. So this is a mural uh, from the tomb of Princess Yang Tai, who is Anla's sister. And this depicts women at court. You'll notice that they have a variety of hairstyles. They have uh, several different uh, types of dress. And you'll notice that several of the women's dresses are low cut enough to show cleavage. This is a lineage chart for the Imperial Lee family. The women we're talking about today come from four successive generations. So you can see here's Princess Pinyang. At least I hope you can see my cursor, my mouse here. Uh, let's see, here's Wu Zetian. Here's the Princess Taiping. Here's the Princess Anla. I put a uh, asterisk up here next to uh, Gaozu to note that he was forced to abdicate. And you can also safely assume that any son not looked as prince did not meet a happy end. Now we're gonna start with the Empress Wu, which might seem a little bit odd to you because she wasn't a princess or born into the imperial family. But as you'll see, she casts such a long shadow over the dynasty that we need to talk about her first. The Empress Wu had a very interesting rise to power. She enters the scene as a low-ranking concubine of Taizong, and somehow, somewhere during this time, catches the eye of his son, Gaozong. Now, after Taizong dies, all of his concubines who were childless were sent to a nunnery to be purified before being turned to the, their families. This was standard operating 
procedure at the time. Now, according to the dynastic histories, Galzong goes to the nunnery to give the women dowries for their future marriages, and he sees Wu. And his empress, who is surnamed Wong, she observes them. She sees how her husband reacts to this woman. And she has Wu called to serve Galzong as a concubine. Now, this is incest by Chinese standards, but Wang is desperate for allies. Her position at court is precarious because she doesn't have any children. She doesn't have any sons. Now, Gao Zong adores Wu, and they have several sons pretty much right off the bat. Beginning in 660, Gao Zong suffers a series of strokes, and Wu begins wielding all the power, even a even attending the emperor's meetings. And just in case you're wondering what happened to the, the previous empress, she was executed for witchcraft at Wu's charge many years earlier. Supposedly, Wu had the woman's body dismembered and preserved in a pickling barrel as a warning for others, which I think is probably a pretty memorable warning. In 684, Gao Zong dies, and Wu briefly places their oldest living son on the throne before uh, seizing the throne in her own name and crowning herself emperor. Now she justifies her act by forging a commentary to a popular Buddhist sutra. This commentary claimed that Wu was a Buddhist sage king who ushered in a golden age. She reigns for 15 years when seriously ill, she abdicates in favor of one of her sons. The Empress Wu was generally judged competent and active in her administration of the government, but highly immoral by Chinese histories, which often harshly condemn her behavior. Now, obviously we don't have any images, at least as far as we know, of the Empress Wu made during her lifetime. So on the left there, you have her official portrait from the Qing Imperial portraits. You have in the center, um, of course, Fan Bingbing, in Empress of China, which was a time series in 2014. And then in the upper right corner, you have a still from the movie Empress Wu, which was made in Hong Kong in 1963. In emphasizing Wu Zetian as China's only female emperor, we risk losing sight of the cultural factors that allowed her to rise. Some scholars point to a long tradition of women in China ruling on behalf of their minor sons or grandsons as an explanation for Wu's reign. But far more significant is the personal freedom and political involvement of women in North China, which I'm defining as the Yellow River Valleys and everything North, during the early medieval period. And this was a result of a long period of mixing and interacting with the Turks from the Central Asian steppe. Now, how intermixed were the Han Chinese and the Turks by 600? So much that the Li family itself was of mixed heritage. And when I say heritage, I'm not talking about the distant past. The founding emperor's mother was Turk, as his first wife. These women brought with them their own culture's ideas about gender and what was a woman's role in society. Steppe societies are quite egalitarian. They were nomadic, which means they had minimal possessions, and everyone had about the same. Now, if you've ever watched Mulan, did you stop to wonder why Mulan knew how to ride a horse? Chinese people didn't ride horses during this time. Steppe peoples rode horses. And indeed, the epic poem that Mulan is based on was written during this period of intermixing. On the steppe, everyone, men, women, children, rode horses, and the adults could also hunt and fire arrows while on horseback. This was likely because step groups tended to be smaller, so every adult was needed to defend the group. The poem Mulan mentions that she has a brother, but he is too young to be drafted by the Khan. Khan is a Turkic title, meaning king. And it ends with an observation. The male runs here and there, while the female has narrower eyes but put the two rabbits running side by side and who can tell which is which. Which pretty much sums up step attitudes towards gender. Now these statues nicely illustrate this point as well. From the Xianbei culture, 
one is male and one is female. Can you tell which is which? The one on the left, by the way, is the woman. Scholars refer to the period of intermixing in the North as part of the period of disunion because there wasn't a unified Chinese state. During this period, we see women's roles expand and they become more active in public life. There are tax receipts and lawsuits, particularly in the frontier regions, showing women as heads of household. Most are women without an adult man, so you could expect them to be acting as a head of household. Uh, a woman past the age of marriage, widows without adult sons, nuns, etc. However, some women obviously had thriving businesses even with husbands at home. Speaking of nuns, the arrival of Buddhism as well as the development of monastic Taoism provided a way for women to exist outside the control of the family structure, although nuns frequently remained within their family homes during this period, and again, that was especially true on the front. Women could also organize, lead, and participate in Buddhist lay societies, which supported monks, text production, provided for temple and shrine construction, and functioned as mutual aid societies. Non-Han women especially served as political leaders. The grandmothers and other senior female members of the imperial family, even wet nurses, exercised considerable power. The Grand Protectress Do, who was the wet nurse of the Second Wei Emperor, was left in charge of the government while the emperor was away on military campaign, and she had to oversee the successful defense of the northern border. Women also acted as regional military commanders or warriors. You I'm sure have already heard about Mulan, but what about the story of Li Ji and the White Snake? Or Consort of State Xian, who in her old age donned armor and led a combined army into battle. The dynastic histories put her helping pacify the southern regions and creating support for the new Sui government. Now she's particularly interesting because she is down in the far south, where uh, nomadic customs would have been unknown. This, by the way, is an image of a man and a woman writing from a joint tomb in around 300. Now, we can see all of these traits in the imperial princesses of the early Tang. The Emperor loved to sponsor riding demonstrations and polo matches between the imperial Li women and the palace women, his concubines. The imperial women hunted and participated in archery contests as well. His sister, the Princess Pingyang, helped found the dynasty. According to the official histories of the dynasty, she probably used her money to build an army of 70,000 men, which she then used to take the capital city of Chang'an. Because of this, she was given a funeral with military honors when she died six years later. Now on your screen, the uh, image on the left is a Tong woman and you know, she is wearing Turkic or steppe dress. She's on horseback playing polo. On the right is a late woodcut showing uh, the Princess uh, Pyong in armor as well with a sword. The Princess Anla was the only surviving child of the Emperor uh, Zhongzong and his Empress, who was surnamed Wei. This round, she petitioned her father to make her his heir, meaning there would have been a second female emperor just a generation removed from the Empress Wu, the Empress was her grandmother. After her father's untimely death, she attempted a coup with her mother's support. She was killed during the fighting, but the fact that she thought she was entitled to rule and was able to persuade at least some others to believe that as well is a testament to how much latitude real women had come to command by this uh, point in history, which is about 705. On the left, a mortuary statue believed to depict a Chinese princess from about 700. On the right is a mural of women from Li Xian's tomb, uh, he died in 706. And I'd just like to point out that the larger women are in Chinese dress, but you notice that the servant in the center is wearing Turkic attire. Lastly, we have the Princess Taiping. She was instrumental in defeating the Princess Anla's coup. Like her great aunt, she had her own army although she didn't lead them into battle, as far as we know. And she was a major presence in her brother's court. She was widely seen as the power behind his throne. And when he unexpectedly abdicated in favor of his son, a very blood power struggle erupted between aunt and nephew. 
After three years, nephew prevailed, and the Princess Taiping was forced to commit suicide. On the left is a mural from the tomb of the Princess Taiping's aunt, Princess uh, Xincheng. And on the right is a statue of an early Tang. You'll note that she is quite thin compared to the women, the Tang women on the opening slide, which are from the High Tang period. And she also has that fantastic butterfly wing hairdo, which is quite exotic. That's the end of the presentation. I hope that this has given you some insight into how these women lived and also um, maybe challenged some ideas of what you thought imperial princesses lived like during this period. So thank you. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> oh no, I've still got your slides in the center. Hang on. How do I get rid of that? There we go. Okay. <laughs> well, thanks for that. That was interesting. It was, <clears throat> excuse me, I would have never picked out um, like the step clothing or the Turkic clothing of, uh, of that middle person in that mural. <laughs> That's... Uh, <laughs> um, did you study art history as, as any like part of your, uh, your PhD work or is that just something that you've picked up as you've gone along or? So not as my PhD work, I did a little bit in my undergrad cause I do really like art history too. Um, there really isn't a form of history. I don't like that's the secret, <laughs> but, um, I do have friends who I went to grad school with who are, um, art historians. And so we would, you know, when we were taking like a class on Buddhism or whatever, um, you know, they would sneak in, you know, the art and we'd talk about the iconography and stuff. So that was very fun. Oh, cool. Yeah. I took a lot of art history in my undergrad too. I think four courses and we didn't have minors at my college, but it would have almost been a minor, I guess. Um, if I had taken one or two more and I was lucky enough, um, my professor for those courses was a, a curator at the Museum of Fine Art in Boston. And he wasn't oh, yeah. super well versed in Asian art. His focus was more like uh, European art history, but he knew a bit. He was a Buddhist himself. And so he knew a bit about some of the some of the Chinese and Japanese art. So that was really cool. Um, so, yeah, I, I sort of can't help myself to like when we were in the talking about some of the archaeological objects in uh, the early China course, I couldn't help but like bring in some art historical type of uh, perspective on it too. Um, cool. So, okay. So we'll open up for Q and A now. So if there's any questions, um, we've got a few here. Let's see. Um, First, we've got page says Tang Dai Nu Xin, great topic. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Let's see. Really want to study ancient China and Chinese history because ever since I've learned some characters' origins that to connect to things in ancient Chinese culture, I've always been interested in studying Chinese history from there. Yeah, it does sort of grow, right? I think. I think we have a lot of people in our audience that are like that. You know, we we do the the character etymology stuff in our dictionary and our courses and stuff. Um, and yeah, I think from there, like an interest in classical Chinese and ancient China, you know, pre modern China, sort of uh, is a, a natural next step um, for a lot of people. So um, let's see. Looking forward to this. I don't want to say the middle period is the best period, but it totally is. <laughs> Way better than early China. <laughs> uh, we can agree to disagree there. <laughs> <laughs> it is fascinating, though. Actually, I had a, a friend when I was in Taiwan <clears throat> uh, named Jeff Humble. And he's, um, his focus was on, I think, Mongolian history in the middle period. Mm, okay. Of course, he also had to learn Chinese and, and classical Chinese. So we started like a classical Chinese reading group together, um, <clears throat> which everyone else in the group was way further along than I was in classical Chinese, but that just forced me to sort of struggle to catch up. Um, but yeah, he's 
super passionate and knowledgeable about that period too. And it was always like uh, something I wanted to learn, but oh, there's only so much time, man. We, we had an email from a customer the other day that was like, there's way more that I want to learn about China than what I have time to learn. And that's totally like, I feel that. <laughs> um, so someone brought up the character that Wuzi Tian created to, to name her, mm -hmm. right? And there's actually more. Yeah. There's there's like a few variants of that character, and there's then there's other characters that she created too. Um, yeah, she did. I mean, how cool is that? Yeah, it I, actually. I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up. Um, I was looking at the Wikipedia page for this the other day because somebody asked about it on our Facebook page. Asked about that particular oh. character, and they were like. Do normal principles of character formation apply to this since she made it up herself? Or, you know, excuse me, I forget Ash's answer to it, but um, there's actually, yeah, so there's two variants of that character for her name, but then there's a bunch of others, like these are supposed to write Tian, and then this is Di, which is interesting because you've got Shan, Shui, and Tu. This is supposed to be, but then these characters basically fell out of use pretty much almost right after the end of her reign. Oh and, yeah. And right. Yeah. yeah. They never really took root. It, yeah. It's hard to mandate character usage. Uh, the PRC discovered this when they did their second round of simplification. People just basically, the first one they, they kind of accepted the second one. They just rejected outright. Um, so yeah, that's, it's tough. Uh, also, we're we're reading in the advanced classical Chinese course that I'm teaching right now. We're going to be reading the um, the piece by uh, Luo Binwang, like the polemic against Wu Zetian, um, in like four weeks from now. So I don't think you'll be to the Tang Dynasty quite yet. Four weeks from mm, now, probably not. Yeah, but it's still like it's close enough that there's a little uh, interesting overlap, and it was totally unplanned, but. Um, yeah. yeah, like the current unit that we're in is all like, you know, BCE, uh, first millennium BCE. But then after next week, we get into the middle period. So there is a, a, a bit of overlap there, which is kind of cool. Uh, let's see. We've got a few thank yous. Oh, that's nice. Thanks. It's going to be a great It class. is going to be a great class. You're absolutely right. It is. It's, it's Yeah. Uh, oh, Marguerite asked, what time will the class be taught? So we talked about this yesterday, and what we decided was, let me see, I've got my notes here. So the lessons will be Tuesdays and Thursdays from 7 to 8 p.m., <clears throat> excuse mm -hmm. me, mountain time. So uh, Dr. Bushio is in, in Utah, so it'll be uh, mountain time, right? That's that's the one? Yep. Okay. So we'll I'll post that to the uh, the course sign up page too. Um, that that is uh, what time is it there for you right now? Uh, it is seven forty three. Seven forty three. Okay, so that's for those of you who have taken our courses before, and when I do the Tuesday morning classes at eleven a.m. my time, it's the same time. Um, it's just that that's seven p.m. for for Dr. Bushio. So. Um, and, and then the Q&A sessions will be Friday at a different time, uh, 10 a.m. Utah time. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the lessons will be on YouTube live, just like this stream. They'll just be private, so they're not accessible by people that aren't in the course. Uh, the Q&A sessions, I assume, will be on Zoom. Is that right? Yeah, that's the plan. Cool. And like with all of our courses, everything's going to be recorded. So... We know that everyone has their own lives and careers and stuff. Um, you don't have to keep pace with the course. There's no pressure there. Uh, you can come to all the live lectures, even if you haven't done the reading, and you can catch up with all the reading yeah. stuff later. It's um, these are these really are self-paced courses that just happen to be taught live at the beginning. So um, you know, think of it that way. Mm -hmm. So if you if you're worried about not having the time. Um, but you're interested, do it anyway, because the all the material will be there for you to go through at your own pace later, including the Q&A sessions. So, 
Um, Absolutely. Oh, here's a good question. When did foot binding start? Oh, that is great. I just thought about this today. <laughs> um, I'll answer this question pretty well. Yeah. It starts um, about 1250, really broadly. It might have started a little bit earlier in the later Tong, but, um, and by later Tong, I don't mean the second half of the Tong dynasty. I mean one of the successor states to it um, that kind of it popped up during the um, brief uh, interregnum between it and the song. Hmm. But 1250, we have good evidence that it has begun. And it starts actually in the palace, among the palace women, um, particularly the dancers. And we think it was originally something kind of like what ballet dancers do today with the way they tape their feet mm -hmm. and they have the, the structured shoes with the laces and all that. So it was to help them sort of dance beautifully, to go up on point, things like that. And from that, it spread to the rest of Han society. It was an ethnically Han practice, not um, ethnic minorities hmm. were involved. Ethnic minorities weren't involved in that. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, things like that do tend to, I think, spread from the upper classes, uh, you know, because it's kind of, oh, if they're doing it, you know, we got to keep up. Um, yeah. Well, and if you noticed in the... Um, the murals and the presentations, you can see the shoes on the women and they do not have bound feet. Oh, and can you pull that back up real quick? I'll put that back up on screen. Uh, yeah. You can see a little bit in that one, but then very well. You can see the feet on both the uh, statue oh, and yeah. then the servant girl. And then you can see, you know, the woman playing polo. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, they don't have bound feet. That starts later. I would think doing something as athletic as polo with bound feet would be pretty difficult. I don't know how you possibly could, honestly. <laughs> well, it's interesting, too, that it started as maybe a bit less severe of a practice to, to help with dance. Yeah, it definitely. Such, a, such an extreme thing later on. Yeah, it definitely um, evolves over time. And um, there's a book written by Dorothy Coe called Cinderella's Sisters, which is uh, a study of foot binding, and it's excellent. And uh, one of the things it thought is that you can see how the styles of foot binding actually change over time. And also there's some regional variation. Um, you know, do you want a little bit of turn up? How high do you want your arch? Do you want it more flat? Um, do you want shoes with heels? Do you want shoes with no heels? It's quite interesting. Wow. That's, I mean, it's just like modern shoes, basically. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Like upturned toes and, you know, uh, heels and things like that. That's interesting. Can you, um, in our interview chat, if you have it there, here, I'll send a test message. Can you type the name of that book and the author? Because I'll, I'll put it in the... Yeah in the chat here on YouTube so that people can look that up for themselves. While you're doing that, I'm going to grab the textbook for this course just so I can show it on screen. So here's the textbook for uh, Dr. Bushio's course. The Rutledge Handbook of Imperial Chinese History, and it's by uh, Dr. Victor Xiong and uh, Kenneth Hammond. Uh, it's a it's an interesting book. I bought it after you told me that this was going to be the book for the course, and I've been able to flip through it a little bit. Uh, it looks it looks quite well done. So, uh, yeah, I really like it um, for an overview, a survey course. I think it's really nicely done that way. Yeah, it seems just right. I mean, it's about a little over 300 pages, which I think is about perfect for something like this. I think the early China textbook that we used was in that neighborhood too. Uh, so there's, I've put that in the chat for everyone. Um, let's see, because of John, I spent a ridiculous amount of money on books with photos of early Chinese artifacts and arts. <laughs> Thanks, John. You're, you're welcome, Rebecca. <laughs> 
Uh, Who among us has my, it? Yeah. <laughs> glad to spread my obsession. Uh, and Bernard, I'm in competition with you about that. I believe that. Um, oh, Rebecca, you're in Utah. I'm in Utah. Coffee. Hey, I would totally be up for it. I think you guys would get along great. <laughs> Um, yeah, look me up. I'm sure that we are not geographically far apart. Yeah. Uh, Rebecca's been in quite a few of our courses, so um, <clears throat> let's see. Guangzhou in the 80s, it was common to see labels on goods in shops written in traditional characters when the packets were clearly labeled with simplified characters. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, um, <clears throat> you know, they still do that with some things, like... I was showing this book the other day in the classical Chinese course. It's a Wang Li book. So, mm -hmm. but so it's nice and, you know, traditional characters on the front. Of course, we've got the sort of Cao Shu abbreviation of that Yan Zipang there. But on the inside, the contents are 100% simplified characters. So I think in my field, especially, there's a lot of that where the cover will be in traditional and you're like, Oh good. I've got a traditional character version. And then you open it up and it's all simplified. Uh, let's see. Bernard also says my wife's grandmother was born in the Qing dynasty. She said she was lucky born poor as she had to help with farm work. And so her feet couldn't be bound. Oh, that's really interesting. The handbooks are generally very good, yeah. Cool. Well, that's all the comments we've got so far. Um, is there anything else you wanted to say about the course before we sort of wrap up? Uh, no, just that I'm really excited to teach it, and I think everyone would enjoy it. Um, I'm just super excited. I love, t I love teaching about Chinese history, and talking to people who are already interested in Chinese history is just yeah. fantastic. Yeah, that's one of the great things about um, doing these courses we've been doing is, you know, we've sort of found a big group of people that are into the same stuff that we're into. And so it's just so much fun uh, being able to teach this stuff and, and talk about it with people that are just as excited about it. So um, cool. Yeah, so I'll put uh, I've put the link to the uh, sign up for the course in the chat. It's also in the description of this video. And of course, I've been, you know, sending out emails. So um, there is a uh, $100 discount before the um, course starts. So if you're interested, now's the time that discount's going to disappear after next Tuesday. So um, of course, it'll still be available to sign up, but uh, now's your best option. Um, all right. Well, I think that's all we've got. I don't see any more questions coming through in the chat. So this is a rare event. We've been able to keep it under an hour. I usually, uh, I always schedule it for an hour and I always go over, like even in the courses that I'm teaching, it's always like, oh, it's an hour and 20. I got to wrap up. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's a long time over. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty bad about managing my time. <laughs> Fortunately, in this sort of format, it's, you know, people can leave and come back and finish it later. So it's not such a big deal. But um, yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, so I'll go ahead and end it here. Let's see. We've got thank you for the interview. Looking forward to the course from Marget. Me too. Ali, thanks so much for this. Yeah, so it's going to be a lot of fun. I'll be there. I won't be in the Q&As because that's uh, very early morning my time, but I'll be on the live stream. So. I'll see you guys there. I'll see you there, uh, Dr. Bushio. Uh, and I'm going to remember the pronunciation of your name from now on. <laughs> <laughs> hey. All right, everyone. Uh, I'll end it here and hope to see you in the course starting next week. Take care, everyone. Bye.